This is the podcast for the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. I'm Cynthia Graber. Scientists who study neuropsychiatric conditions and treatments often use rodent models to do so. From depression to anxiety to memory impairment and impulsivity, there are certain rodent behaviors that are used to represent these types of conditions in humans. And to use these models, researchers have had to watch the animals live or on video and jot down every instance of, say, exploratory behavior. That is labor intense. Uh, It takes hours and hours to watch and study these, these videos, and it's unreliable because we're just humans. Sometimes we get tired, we miss little things, and we're all different, right? So it's, if you and I both score the same behavioral video, we'll have slightly different results. So that's not what you want in, in science. Johannes Bohacek is assistant professor at the ETH Zurich in Switzerland. He says that commercial software systems have been developed that can deliver a fairly simple behavioral readout, such as where a mouse is going, how fast it's moving, and where it spends most of its time. And for some tests, such as how the animal moves in water, which models depression, that can be useful. For others, such as an exploratory rearing behavior, humans can recognize it immediately, but it's difficult to score with commercial software. So Dr. Boacek and his colleagues created a new system based on machine learning, and they published the results of their study in the journal Neuropsychopharmacology, along with a review of the field. The team started with an open source software called Deep Lab Cut. Where you as a user have a nice user interface and you identify points of the mouse or rat or whatever object you're interested in, And the computer software learns to recognize and track these body points in videos that it has never seen, right? So what you get out of this is essentially a very high resolution body point tracking of your mouse in our case. And we use these data to feed them into machine learning algorithms that can then give us two kinds of information. The first one is is very simple to say, Let's get the same info that we get from commercial software. Where is the animal? How fast does it move, et cetera? But then the machine learning algorithms, you can train them with based on on human scoring and say, based on these input features, recognize every time that I say, this is a rear, or this is a groom, or this is the animal sitting, or this is the animal running. And and what that ends up doing is it automates this laborious process of uh, pencil and paper based behavior scoring. And it gets rid of some of the human variation that is otherwise inevitably part of this kind of research. You had to develop the code and algorithms to make this useful for your lab and for other labs, right? Right. What, what we were trying to do is to provide code that lets anyone who has basic understanding of coding implement this and analyze their own videos with the code that we've already provided. So of course, generating these machine learning algorithms, that isn't trivial. Your average neuroscientist who is interested in a specific molecule or specific behavior is not going to be able to do this. But that's what our group and many other groups around the world are actually trying to to develop these more user-friendly tools. So there are currently different approaches to, to try to see which one works best. And I think the ultimate question is, not only what's the best approach, but what is the approach that can be implemented in a very easy way and that actually catches on, right, and spreads throughout all the neuroscience labs. Our approach was actually more of a of a benchmarking effort, right? So that's really what our uh, research paper is about, is to say, we have a new approach, we do provide a machine learning algorithm, but above all, we wanted to actually show that it can outperform commercial solutions at a fraction of the cost, of course, and that it can reach human accuracy. And it did. You trained the software on a number of tests that commercial software is not particularly effective for, such as the elevated maze, where a curious animal will want to explore the open arms of the maze, while an anxious one will stay in the dark, closed arms where it feels safe. And then you compared your software to commercial software and to human coding, and it matched human accuracy and was a significant improvement on traditional commercial systems. But it's not the only attempt at such a solution. How does this fit into what's being done in the field right now? Yeah, um, I'd like to be very careful to say that, you know, we we don't mean to claim that our approach is the best um, and that everyone should use it. This is really one of many approaches. And and they essentially cluster into two broad categories. The, The first category is what's called supervised machine learning. And supervised meaning that 
you tell the machine learning algorithm what kind of behaviors you're interested in, like all the examples we've discussed now, head dipping, rearing, grooming, etc. Then the machine learning algorithm can, can automatically re recognize them and you save time because you don't have to do this manually. The other approach is unsupervised. And unsupervised means that the algorithm tries to recognize the building blocks of behavior. That's a little bit tricky to understand what that means, right? But behavior is, is composed out of very short sequences and we don't really understand what they are and how to define them. But algorithms based on, on clustering can pool together those little bits of behavior that are similar and that occur over and over again and then say this is cluster one. We don't know what it is, but it's cluster one. And then another set of behaviors might be cluster two, three, four, five, and so on. And you later on as a human come back and look at these clusters and, and then identify what is it that the computer has identified as a variable that is potentially interesting. So these are two approaches that are being pursued actively. And it's going to be exciting, I think, to see which one of them turns out to be better suited for what kind of research questions. It's also possible that in the end, you will somehow integrate them into an approach that kind of does both. Does this mean that, in theory, the system could pick up on behaviors that humans haven't noticed that could have implications for research? Yes, I think that's exactly the, the great hope behind all this. Um, that as humans, we simply don't know what the animal is doing exactly. And maybe this unsupervised approach can pull out nuances that we were not even aware of. What are the challenges in taking what you and others in the field are doing and then passing it on so that another lab can use your tools? The, the approaches that are coming out now, and ours included, they still have to prove that they can transfer between research labs and setups. And, and that's not a trivial issue, right? That is the power of the commercial software providers they essentially sell you one setup that you cannot change or shouldn't change and you have to stick with that and then everything works and everyone can purchase this and for our approaches currently it's it's kind of a homemade thing right and so other labs have to try to set it up similarly and then we have to test whether this actually transfers so i think what we will need is more standardized approaches that have the flexibility to adapt to different labs and there's a lot going on in the field and i think it will be exciting to to follow up on this and see uh, what are the solutions that actually work. You say that in theory, any lab could take the tools you developed and train the system based on their own needs, putting in the specific behaviors that the system should recognize. Are you working on developing a user interface on top of the algorithms that would make it even easier for a lab to use? Yeah, so we, we currently haven't done this. I know that some other groups are, are onto this and some of those products are already out there. Um, I think this will be an effort in the field where several different labs try this and in the end we will see if one solution fits all or if there are several different solutions that work for different applications. In your review of the field, you address broader issues related to where this type of approach is headed. What challenges do you see as it becomes more common and easier to implement? One of the things that, that we don't have in behavior is we have no standardization. So if I talk about a certain behavior, I can define it, but there's no guarantee that another lab around the world is going to talk about that very same behavior and that they're going to have it defined in exactly the same way. If you think about genetics, uh, the genes are very clearly labeled. There are consortia that guarantee that this labeling is consistent and that it gets updated all the time. And so if someone in Switzerland and someone in the US studies the same gene, they can rest assured they're indeed studying the same gene. This isn't true for behavior at the moment. And so one issue that I could foresee is once every lab starts measuring not two or three behaviors, but maybe 20, 30, or 100 behavioral nuances, then it will maybe get very difficult to compare the findings of one lab to the findings of another lab. So maybe this is where we also need behavior consortia or some kind of smart solution to make sure we standardize our behavior profiling approaches. And as far as I know, there is no effort underway to address this. This is the podcast for the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. To read the articles discussed in the podcast, go to www.nature.com slash NPP. I'm Cynthia Graber.